Oh. Yeah. oh can we start over? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. keep going. Keep going. <laughs> All right. Episode 10. It's entitled Awkward because... Because Octopus landed on Guy's head. He needed help. And those two are standing around with confusion. Octopus gets off his head, and he's still, like, in confusion. Can't take it anymore. I can't even begin. So this guy gets eaten right here, and now he's trying to get out, right? Right. Not trying. Did get out, but somebody else didn't. The newspaper flies through the air and hits the porch with a loud thump. A few seconds later, the old man comes barreling out of the house, yelling at the top of his lungs. He screams at the paper boy, who speeds away on his bike as fast as his legs will let him. The old man gives up and turns to head back up to the porch. He sees a young girl in a red dress and an impossibly large red bow in her hair, holding a limp jump rope. She is staring at him with a dropped jaw, aghast and curious about what all the obscenities she just heard come out of the old man's mouth could possibly mean. The old man stares back at her, then raises his paper threateningly, and she runs off like a bolt. The old man drags his bones up to his rocking chair, sits down, and out of habit and comfort touches his shotgun that always leans up against the house in arm's reach. He then unfolds the paper and scans the headline that reads, Another bank cleaned out. Police baffled. The old man mumbles something about the world going somewhere in a handbasket. The old man is a magnificent mumbler. If they gave awards out for it, he would get the Nobel Prize in hums of... You could just imagine how well the acceptance speech would go over. The old man flips through the paper, complaining and mumbling about this and that. Well, episode 10 here. Um, we have, to me, what looks like a little girl with a uh, red ribbon who is somewhat confused of the, the octopus attacking another young man so well the girl she, she's confused she's confused you know the octopus is attacking her brother whatever this might be she's saying help and with the confusion of that it is not in its habitat which is awkward and obviously <laughs> her friend is running because there's an octopus on his on his head After running for a block and a half, the little girl with a big red bow decides that skipping rope is much more fun and skips the rest of the way home. She walks in the door and her mom calls her in the kitchen. Out skipping rope again? And with no breakfast to boot? The girl says nothing. Well, says her mom, you need to have a big breakfast if you're going to be out playing. Now, do you want cereal? The little girl shakes her head. How about some eggs and toast? Asks her mom. But the little girl shakes her head. Don't tell me you want grapes again. The enormous bow shakes up and down feverishly as the girl nods. Well, her mom says while grabbing the bowl of grapes. I've never seen a girl eat so many grapes. We've got to expand your palate, young lady. The girl jumps up to the chair atop a phone book and pulls up to the table. But I suppose grapes are better than nothing at all. Her mom puts the bowl down in front of her and the little girl starts eating up all the grapes. a lot going on. I don't know, like, just the chaos, I guess. I don't know. We're, oh, and the shark's over here. Oh, so there's actually a person in there. And then what is this, a superhero? Or Oh, that would be another way in, but where does the octopus come in? <laughs> That's the question mark. Where does the octopus come in? This man obviously bought an octopus hat and then didn't realize it was still alive. <laughs> so he brought it home to his daughter and then it started eating its, his brains. <laughs> and she's just confused because she has no idea. It's now 8.15 a.m., and the night watchman of Olio's magnificent marine park is patiently waiting for his relief from his 12-hour shift, who is 15 minutes late. While he is upset inside, he is much too nice of a man to show it to his fellow employees. He doesn't want to complain, either, because this is the best security job he has ever had. He loves roaming the grounds late at night. There is so much to see. 
As the story goes, Bolio's magnificent marine park used to be a traveling marine circus. The truth is, is that it was only traveling for about 50 miles until they realized that carting around thousands of gallons of water with tons upon tons of fish was a logistical nightmare. They broke down in an empty lot of a suburban neighborhood and set up shop. Bolio's magnificent marine park features the aerial acrobats of the flying blue angelfish, the seminal seahorse rodeo, the square dancing cephalopods, the clam choir, which don't actually sing, but opens and closes their shells to the Zay's Carmen in a crude form of lip syncing. And Mr. Speech, the incredible talking shark, which doesn't quite speak, but slams its stomach on the outside of the edge of the tank and lets out a sort of grunting noise, to which the audiences politely clap. A cranky old neighbor of the park tried to get the flying angelfish removed, to no avail. But, being gracious neighbors, Olios moved the flying angelfish exhibit towards the back of the park, away from the view of the old man's porch, and moved the talking shark to the front. The night watchman loved his job so much, because it was at night that all the water-born talent perfected their acts. He was the captive audience to all the new routines and failed attempts. His relief lumbers through the door and plops his weight down on the chair in front of the TV. Morning, Sam he says. Morning, Ralph, replies the night watchman, and he heads home for some well-needed rest. Huh. So is it that the octopus is kind of in charge, even over the shark? Although there's this little bandit guy. That I have no idea. I'm not even going to touch that one. <laughs> it's like a hamburglar. Fish, it's a fish burglar. Maybe. Like a... No, no, no. What do you think? It's deeper than that. Oh, it has to be, yeah. Maybe it's a metaphor. So, this poor fellow, after all these things, man, he had to leave. Mm. He had to leave. So he took off. He went for sail. So they're connected? Oh, yeah. Okay. He went swimming. Um, the shark is a humanitarian. <laughs> so he doesn't eat other fish. Oh. He just eats people. In a dark alley next to the city museum, an impossible, tall, suspicious-looking man wearing a great hat and a long trench coat sneaks up to a dumpster. The man has, attached to his person by bits of string, five pet flies that buzz around him. He unties the end of the bows of four of the flies. They immediately buzz up to the side of the brick building to a small vent, attach themselves to the screws, and spin counterclockwise until the screws come out. The vent's grill falls on top of the dumpster with a loud crash. The flies return to their master and obediently put their leashes back on. The man then pulls open the bottom of his trench coat, and a tiny little man appears holding a sack and wearing an eye mask. The tall man grabs the Lilliputian and throws him up into the air and he dives in the vent. The tall man hears someone coming around the corner. He quickly pulls out a small red vial from his trench coat, opens it, and fly number five goes to the vial's edge for a big gulp. The tall man then unties the fly, and it shoots off as a security guard comes around the corner to investigate the mysterious noise. The fly bites down on the security guard, who immediately passes out from the strong tranquilizer the fly carries. Moments later, the tiny thief appears holding a ruby the size of his head. The small man takes a brave jump down, and the tall man catches him. The tiny thief scoots back inside the trench coat. Fly 5 comes back to his string after a few victory laps, and the team walks off down the alley into the dark. The city museum has just been burgled by Le Couture Bandits, the Dark Bandits, an infamous French team of thieves who has been responsible for the loss of property valuing in the tens of millions.